up to all of you. <laughs> it's a temperamental order. Okay. Uh, so welcome to all of you for, 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 for joining us. Um, the bit of housekeeping first. Should you, should you hear the fire alarm go off? and you'll know it's the fire alarm, uh, please leave by the front door, the door that you came in by, and congregate on the pavement outside travel lodge. It's a very boring fire alarm. It makes a real loud noise. Mm -hmm. In my student days, I worked as a usherette in the Odin at South End, and the fire alarm there was the two three blind mice, which I think is <laughs> much more entertaining. <laughs> Um, the occasion of this event is, as I say, our 50th birthday party. It is, it is now 50 years since Brahma Kumaris has been uh, offering courses, programs, evening events, daytime events on meditation, personal development as a service to the community here in the UK. And so that's, the, that's why we got the, the birthday balloons um, spread around. Um, and the title is Putting the Light into Leadership, because um, thank you, we've all been through this uh, difficult time, which will have challenged us in different ways, and it's about finding a positive and constructive way forward. Before I introduce um, our, two, our two conversationalists, um, I'd like to ask Kenny to just come and have a few words of, uh, of greeting. Thank you very much for having me. It's very nice to be here um, in the very short time that I've um, been in this wonderful building. Um, I've been told about this amazing company that is incredibly large and does such wonderful things for the community. And I think it's really important that there is, especially for young people nowadays, with the pressure that is increasing, that it's very important for this mentality of being grounded and having this ability and platform to serve the community and stay true to yourself. I think it's very important that young people are involved in it as well as spreading it around the community. I'm very excited to be here today and I cannot wait to hear everything that is to be said. So thank you very much. <laughs> So one of the people having a conversation uh, this afternoon or this evening is Sister Janti. Sister Janti has been with Brahma Kumaris from a very young age. She now, in terms of talking about leadership, she now heads up the uh, Brahma Kumaris here in the UK, but she also has a leadership role um, uh, well in the organisation worldwide. She was very recently promoted to that position, and quite often it's the kind of custom that you congratulate people when you get promoted, but I think in this case it means more meetings, <laughs> so um, I'm not quite sure, but anyway. <laughs> um, we're, we're pleased to have her here uh, today. She's here today, she's in Brighton tomorrow, and then Friday she's off to Glasgow um, to head up the Brahma Kumaris team that's organising events at COP26. So kind of gives you a bit of an idea of um, how what a busy, busy person. And Vicky, I kind of was thinking, well, I, we, we all know Vicky, we've known Vicky a long time, but I've had a few surprises recently. Before everything closed down, Vicky used to come here to meditate regularly. And Vicky always came and sat at the front. There are some people who always sit at the back. But Vicky would always come and sit at the front. So she's obviously a very upfront person. And I do know that when she made a, a contribution to the bits of discussion we had in between the meditation commentaries, they were always thoughtful. Uh, obviously someone who deep, thinks deeply about, um, about personal development and so on. But it's only recently that I've discovered all of these other things about Vicky, um, her business successes, and her engagement in the, um, in the political life of Worthing, and some of the details of that are in the invitation um, that we actually sent you. The um, kind of the way the evening will go, the programme, uh, Vicky will actually give you a little bit more detail. Uh, and so now I'd like to invite Sister Janti and Vicky to come onto the stage. <laughs> Thanks. 
Can you hear me in here? Is it working? Ready? Right, all working now. Well, thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Hedy, for your little contribution there. It's really great to hear from you, and we'll have a chat later. When I was asked to do this, I was obviously very honoured. But my next task was, Vicky, could you invite some leaders from Worthing, uh, community leaders, because I've done a lot of community stuff myself. And I thought, yeah, I'd love to do that. So I sat down and I thought, where do I start? How do I approach people? And it was an interesting task. So I set about on my email, or do I phone people up, or do I just talk to them? But how do you ask somebody if they want to come to a, a spiritual place, spiritual, <laughs> you know? And I, some people think I'm a bit woo-woo anyway. And this was an opportunity to, you know, people think I'm even more woo-woo than I was before. I thought, I don't mind actually, because I've been coming here since 2018. And you're here later as we go through the conversation that I've, you know, just been true to myself now. So lots of things have changed. And as you said, I've, I'm completely, I'm, gr I'm grounded now, a lot more grounded than I used to be. And I thought, I just want to share my journey and who better to share it with, <laughs> Sister Genty. So we've, since I've been here as well, Sister Genty's name has been mentioned so many times. So this is the first time I've met her tonight. So just sitting here is amazing. So I really hope you enjoy the evening. So what I'm gonna do, my memory is not like it used to be, but to help guide me along, I have set a lovely acronym, being, from being a borough councillor, I had all these weird acronyms under the sun. <laughs> so I, I've done this acronym and for the word light, because it's put in the word light into leadership. So what we're gonna do is ask these, each letter is gonna represent something and hopefully you'll be taking that away with you. If you don't remember it, or you'll just remember the word light anyway. But I think the first one for L <coughs> of light would be putting the light in leadership. And so I'd be thinking about what does light mean to me and what does it mean to Sister Genty? So who should go first? Why not yourself? Do you want me to go first? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Rather than me talk loads and loads and loads and preaching about light, I think I'd like to talk about people who would be a really good example of light and leadership. And over the last few years, I've come across many people, community people, who are amazing. When I was a counsellor, I met Shirley here's amazing as well. Terry has been part of my charity talent within you as well, a volunteer. And to me, these people just tirelessly just do this community work. Don't ever get paid for it, but just keep doing it and doing it. There's something in there that is driving them and drove me as well for my charity, Talent Within You. It's really hard work. And sometimes you think, why am I doing this? But there's something you can't stop it for some reason. But one person in particular who really, I think is a really good example of this. When I was doing Talent Within You, when I first set it up, I needed some students to come along to, to the workshops. It was a seven month program. And we wrote to all the schools and we didn't get much interest apart from two schools. And one was, well, three schools actually, we had Worthing High, Davison's and Lady of Sion. And I went along to all the schools, but Lady of Sion, I met the head teacher, his deputy at the time, and it's called Steve Jeffries. And I went into his office and it was unlike any other head teacher's office I've ever seen before. My memory of a office, a head teacher's office, was a menacing ruler on the table. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the fear, you know, the fear as you walk into the head teacher's office. But I walked into Steve's office and I was so pleasantly surprised. It was dim, it's low light, and it was all candlelit and flickering candles. No ruins anywhere. <laughs> and it had beautiful 
uh, pictures on a wall, just lovely messages. And it just had this really nice feeling, gentle feeling. And I, I wasn't scared at all. I, I didn't want, actually, you can get rid of me. <laughs> so to, to me, we talk about the disrupting industries and technology, but I would love to see the education mm. sector being disrupted and having more head teachers like Steve. Um, I, I think we've actually got a video, haven't we, of Steve? He was a member here. Oh, it's been a few times, as if by magic. Here he is. I'll shut up for a bit and Steve's going to talk. <laughs> I feel really blessed to be able to share a short video with you. Sorry I can't be with you today. I'm somewhere in the Midlands, uh, but would have loved to have been right there with you to celebrate 50 years of Brahma Kumaris here in the UK. And it's relatively recently that uh, our paths crossed. That was lovely Jasmine coming to uh, Our Lady of Science School, where I'm now the head teacher, to give an assembly. And I was just blown away in a very quiet way by her sense of peace and that she seemed very one with, with herself and, and what's going on around her and nothing seemed to be stressing her out. And for a very, very busy uh, teacher and leader of education, I was quite envious <laughs> after years and years of feeling very stressed, very tired, uh, exhausted, but energized to carry on doing the job, which I love and uh, just really believe it's so important to, to work with young people and serve them. So finding out more about Brahma Kumaris, learning that we have everything we need right here within uh, that we have strength and power, love and light, and we can sit back and observe what's going on uh, before us and to just watch and sit and give ourselves time to respond. And often observe, observation is, is enough. Um, I'm very aware of this sense of myself right here, uh, and sometimes when I'm caught up in the busyness of school life or life in general, I just return to this place where I know I am, where I've always been and always will be. And that sense of security, stillness, rock, power, like an oak tree, absolutely embedded, rooted, and whatever is going on around me, if I just return to who I am, to this being that is so full of light and love and joy and peace and happiness and just wants to give, give, give kindness and love. If I return to that person, I return to me and everything else is an illusion, a part of the game, background noise. So thank you so much for letting me share uh, in a small way on this very, very important celebration of the Brahma Kumaris being here in the UK for 50 years. And I, I think more than ever, your message, your understanding, your knowledge, your wisdom is very much needed for those who find themselves distracted and caught up in the illusion. So I wish you a wonderful day. I have written you a song as well. I don't know if they'll play it today, but um, hopefully uh, you will hear it at some point. When I met Steve in 2000 at my charity, it was him that introduced me to Brahmi Kumaris, and he just happened to mention it. And when I went to Davidson's school, Joe, who was there, also mentioned it, and I thought, I've got to find out who this Brahmi Kumaris <laughs> is. So I went, I went home and I Googled it, and I thought, oh, this is not far from me. It was literally an eight-minute walk from my flat on the seafront. So I came along to a Sunday talk. And the Sunday talks were just so inspiring. I think this one was happiness from within and I was going through a bad relationship at the time. And it just struck a chord with me. And I was hooked in a sense. And there's a, funny enough, as I was coming in tonight, there's a sign outside for 
another really um, good talk this Sunday, and the sub it's about making the right decisions. And I think that's what light leadership is to me, when you're feeling grounded and you're not driven by fear, which I'm not so much now. Occasionally you have a slip, I think everyone does. But I'm not so, I'm not so driven by fear, so I am able to make the right decisions. So that's what it is to me. How about you? <laughs> Beautiful, thank you for sharing that. Um, many years ago, in fact, I can date it, it would have been around 1998. Um, I was at a conference far away in California, and some of you might have heard about it, the State of the World Forum. Um, they had, I don't think they have them anymore, but for 20 years, they had conferences all the time. And this particular event, at the end of it, they said, Peter Senge was speaking, and um, I just knew a little bit about him. I didn't know him as a person, but later on, we I have got, got to know him very well. But um, he gave a talk in which he was talking about leadership, and he said, the first thing he said was, the quality of a leader for the 21st century is humility. And I was very surprised. But I was very pleased because I knew that um, that is a reality because from my spiritual background, of course, I knew that when there's ego coming into play, things don't work out as you want them to because anything ego driven um, is not going to be successful. It's not going to win hearts. It's not going to win cooperation and it's going to be a problem. And where there is humility, and I've seen it within my own organization, I had the good fortune of meeting the founder, Brahma Baba. I've had the amazing fortune of living with Daddy Janki in the same room for 40 years. And so I've seen leadership in action with a huge amount of humility. And there's another term that's actually used quite a lot nowadays. I don't think it was then. And that is a server leader, servant leadership. And again, that's a term that comes within our own teachings in a very big way. Um, being a server, being an instrument, being um, a servant. And so that idea of humility within a leader is to me the epitome of light. Ego is the heavy hand, <laughs> and lightness is the humble server, the one who's actually there to be able to serve people and serve the world. Um, I met a woman a few years ago, this would have been 2019, and she'd come from Argentina. And at that time, she was the vice president of her country. Um, her first name is Gabriel. And those who are more familiar with South America might remember her second name, and I can't. But um, she was in a wheelchair, and she's been in a wheelchair for a long time. A car accident left her that way, and she had pain, a lot of pain. But um, she was speaking with um, a former president of India on the same platform. And she had come as our guest to explore what is meditation and so on. And she said that what made me choose to get into politics is because I wanted to serve my people. Now, I haven't heard many politicians speak in that way, and I wish they did, because I know that if there is that awareness of actually being a server, it would make such a huge difference to the state of our world. And so light and leadership is for me summarized by these two aspects humility and being a server and then truly you're filled with the light from above you're filled with your own inner light and you're able to achieve good things not for you but for others that's so beautifully put i can put that better myself <laughs> Actually, Shirley's been to a few council meetings, haven't you? As have I. And um, there are a few egos around the room there. <laughs> just a few, maybe more than a few. But I, I 
wanted to be a borough councillor in the first place to make Worthing even better than it is now. Um, and I was quite shocked when I went to my first council meeting. And it's quite sad because I think all councillors do start off wanting to be uh, doing it for their own town. But when you get into whatever, whatever group you're in, uh, you have a like a leader of that group and then you have a leader of committees. And I think maybe it's because it's structured wrong financially, but I think because there's more money for being a leader, people are fighting for the money, you know, and it becomes that. And, it, it, and then it turns into being a bit about ego. And it's sad and it just, I think people end up changing for the wrong reason. So that's hence I got out of politics in 2018 to start the charity. Um, but I still have some very good friends there. So now we go on to I. Does anyone know what I is? Inspiration. Yes. <laughs> You've read my script, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, what is it? Well, your, it's your turn to go first. <laughs> sure. Um, for me, inspiration is having a mind that's clear, not full of fluff and clutter, because then you're actually able to catch inspiration. Because whether it's coming from something deep inside of you, or whether it's coming from above, or whether it's just the creativity that's enabling you to achieve something, um, inspiration is not something which is me inspiration is something that's coming to me. If you think about all the great artists who created the amazing temples that we still have thousands of years old, um, if you think about all the masterpieces that they created in those days, um, the arts, we have ancient art styles in terms of dance and music and so on across the world. And those were inspired and the people never signed their name at the bottom because they felt it was coming from outside of them. And even other artists since in modern times, you know, they feel that they've been inspired to do something. And so inspiration in terms of leadership is very, very important because then it actually helps dissolve the ego because you know that it's not you that's actually doing something, but it's an inspiration that's driving you and motivating you. So I feel that inspiration is a very, very important ingredient, but not just for leaders. I think even just to be able to be a civilized human being in today's world, you need to be inspired. And if I'm inspired, then I'll be able to rise above the general state of orderliness or even negativity that exists. If you think about how negative the influences are in today's world, um, whether it's advertisements that are bashing you, whether it's, I won't mention other names, but lots of things going on that are highly negative. And if I can be inspired to go up above, beyond all of this, then I can be a real human being, a civilized human being, instead of the less than human behavior that we sometimes see today. So for everyone, I think inspiration is absolutely vital. That is the motivating factor. Beautifully put again. <laughs> I was going more from what I'm inspired by. And I'm inspired by people who just in a bad situation find the good in it. And an example of that as well is a lady, she lives in Broadwater called Claire, which she was invited tonight, but she wasn't well, so she couldn't come. But throughout COVID, she set up a, a WhatsApp group, community WhatsApp group, and there's quite a few people who were completely, um, what's it, when well, they couldn't go out at all. Uh, shielding. That's the word, shielding. shielding. And she was, just, she was enabling people to go around there and take deliveries or if people would run out of things. And to me, you know, it was pretty scary in the first lockdown because nobody, it's the first time it happened. The roads were empty. 
And it's a strange place. And throughout of all that negativity, she found that space. And that it would have been great if she was here today, but I just I thought she should be, have a mention anyway. But so what I think that is one thing that inspires me. It's it's that 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 inner drive that people have. But also in business, I've always been, being a creative, I'm one of these people who likes doing loads of different things, like something shiny and new comes up, I want to do it. And I'm always being told off for not focusing. So these people um, who are like the top businessmen, I'm not very good with my names tonight. Who's the guy who's SpaceX? Oh, that's the one, thank you. Him, how do you know, <laughs> how do you know what to keep focusing on and so so you'll get you might have a whole load of things but there's that one thing and that you've got that one thing in you that knows how to focus on that thing and it must be something in there that's guiding you and I have to say since I've been coming here right I'm not being more focused but what I have been I'm focused in a sense what I've done is I've done what I'm using my intuition to guide me, which I never did before. I think maybe I was being driven by a fear before. So I, although I'm doing lots of different things, I'm focused on that day. So for a Monday, I'll do my illustration. On a Tuesday, I'll do my techie stuff. On a Wednesday, I do my client work. And so I've become more focused that way. And we go on to truthful in a minute. Oh, I've just told you what the tea is. <laughs> but, yeah, to me, a really to be inspired, I'm inspired by people who have got that, they know they can find that thing, the right thing to focus on. And I think that does come from within. Mm. And what have I got? My, it wasn't actually the tea. I think tea is something else, but it does come through something else that we'll talk about in a minute. And the other thing I'm really inspired by, and I think we can all be inspired by, is nature. So I love my walks on the beach, but it never lets you down, does it? It might rain, but we just need different clothes to wear, don't we? So, <laughs> you know, it might be a bit windy. We just wrap up. <laughs> but I always go for my walks on the beach where I do my meditation when I'm not here. And I, it never lets me down. It inspires me. And I mean, this morning, the colours were beautiful. and I, I could I it made me make the right choice because I woke up this morning and I had a really jam-packed day and I could have just sat I incidentally my flat is right opposite the beach so I'll be looking out and if I hadn't gone out I would have been quite resentful thinking I'm sitting here and <laughs> everyone else is out there having fun <laughs> but I, I made that decision and I went out and just for an hour and sat there and meditate grounded for my hands on the ground so I got some of that charge and it's brilliant so I made that right decision and yeah, I think that's inspiration for me. Great. It was very lovely because um, one is, I was talking about the inner inspiration and you were talking about the things that inspire you. So mm. I think that's a perfect balance yeah. because both things work. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Although as we will go on, <laughs> I've got one thing I've learned here is to look within and not look outside, but right. I'm sure you'll cover that later. <laughs> <laughs> So, G, does anyone know what G is? T, are you going to do T? Yeah. Thank you, Palmer. I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. G is just spelling. <laughs> it's actually genuine, which is where the truth will come in. So that's where I got a bit confused. So it's my turn to go first, isn't it, really? So I think I just gave a little bit away in the previous one. So just being, a, you know, the focus thing. I am not somebody who focuses. I cannot focus on one thing. So why am I trying to be something I'm not? And in the, you know, it's just being totally honest and just honest with yourself and honest with what you want to do. And the word that's coming to me at the moment is what I've been most of my life is a people pleaser. And so therefore I'm being true to everyone else, but not myself. And I think really when I was a counsellor, I was a little bit like that because there's so many people to make happy at the council you've got the public and when you're on the planning committee you're always going to have somebody who's upset so it's terrible for a people pleaser because when you've got the first person, person who's putting in the planning application so they want it to go ahead and the person who doesn't like it so you're going to upset someone maybe it's a good test for a people please <laughs> but I, th I think that's the thing and when you're trying to please everyone you end up being half unhappy and resentful 
I think you're just not being true to yourself. And we, we, we're going to go to values a little bit in a minute, but I think it's just understanding what makes you happy and finding the truth and everything. And a, an example, there's a thing because I'm doing, I'm a brand consultant, so I'm really into brand archetypes and that's a, it's a really good exercise to do. Who's your brand ar archetype? You've got the sage, um, the caregiver, you've got the powerful one, and there's lots of different ones. And I was always a sage. And last year I had a bit of a, I had a biopsy, which revealed I had, it wasn't cancer, but it was one of cancer. And I had um, like high estrogen levels in my body. It's in my womb, basically. And they're estrogen receptors. And they just wanted to pump me full of chemicals, basically, to counteract the estrogen. And so I said, actually, I don't really want more chemicals in my body. Because if I've got, to me, it's not being true because you're just pumping me more of something else. It's, I need to get to the source of the problem. So getting to the source of the problem is the truth for me. So I said, I want to do it the natural way. Um, would you give me another biopsy in three months to see if what I'm doing is right? So I, he said, yes, which was really cool because this is throughout COVID. So I was really grateful to him. And anyway, I, I did a load of research and I found out I was, I was a meat eater at the time. I read that they pump this meat full of chemicals just to fatten it up for us to eat. Um, and they uh, also there's cadmium worthing a lot of the Britain the whole world actually there's cadmium under the earth it's like a heavy metal toxic heavy metal and it's in some of our water and cadmium is related um, the strong link between that and endometrial cancer but the good news is I found out selenium counteracts that and what's high in selenium Brazil nuts <laughs> so I have three Brazil nuts today I don't eat meat I eat everything organic and just have broccoli tablets and in three months, I went back for my biopsy and it's completely clear. Wow. <laughs> and so to me, that more than anything, I was determined, actually, we're going back to the determined in the previous lesson, weren't we, inspiration. I was quite pleased with myself for that because I, you know, and I made this blog and I, what really upsets me now is when I was, I was making this blog to share my story and just say to everyone, look, come and you can do it as well, if that's the case. And I went onto Facebook and there's an endometrial cancer uh, Facebook group. And there's ladies with stage three and four endometrial cancer. And I kind of said, you know, have you heard about what I tried? And nobody's doctors haven't even mentioned it to them. So my mission now is if I won a lottery or something like that, mm -hmm. I would love to literally do a big research project to see if we could change, you know, lives just by Follow, you know, doing something similar to what I did. Even if I'd saved one life, I feel like I've made a difference. And that's the truth. It's the real truth. And so the big thing, I get quite upset about big pharmaceutical companies who don't, they just won't <coughs> listen. So, but so one thing I want to get across here is please don't stop taking any medicine if you are under any care. This is something I did at my own total risk and I was getting tested three months later. So it's really important that nobody ever stops it. But I just really want to get across here. It's the truth. And that was what the truth was to me. That's just one little thing. Mm -hmm. Very good. <laughs> um, I think you were very courageous to embark on a journey that that must have been a real inspiration inside mm -hmm. that this is what I want to do. And that's how I'm going to get well. Um, congratulations, really. That's brilliant. Um, as you were speaking, I was remembering a few things that I've come across in recent times, well, over the years. And the first one was that there was, um, there's a woman who's um, a colonel, she's a medical doctor, but she's also a colonel in the army. And so various situations, and she happened to be part of a committee, this would have been in the 80s, that was exploring the whole situation um, with food and the impact of food. And there was a lot of research that had been done in terms of the impact of meat on health. And it was all bad news. But the meat lobby in the USA, this was in the USA, um, intervened in a very, very aggressive way 
um, to ensure that that report was never made public. And that was my first encounter with what's going on with politics and money in the world. And the second was when, much later, but not so long ago, um, I understood that the cigarette manufacturers had a big, big lobby that created, because the medical science was saying that smoking creates lung cancer. And so what these people did was to pay scientists, and of course they were in their payroll, and so they weren't there to uncover truth. They were there to support their masters. And so they found ways to instill doubt in people's minds about the research that was talking about smoking and cancer. And of course, for years and years, this debate continued um, because scientists were also saying, no, it's fine, it's okay, it doesn't. Um, and so the, the seed of doubt meant that you couldn't get any further. And then the third has been fairly recently, I've understood that um, with climate change science, again, the same thing has happened. And as I see, this was only a recent discovery for me. Um, the climate change scientists have been saying that um, human intervention, and in particular fossil fuel usage, has caused the increase in heat and so on. And they've been saying this since 1972, actually. And more and more scientific evidence, but also just your own experience of the weather and what's going on in the world, it confirms all of this. But the fossil fuel industry took lessons from the um, smoke, the cigarette manufacturers hired the same lawyers who had worked for the cigarette companies. And they also told them the strategy was to get people to start having doubts about the science. And so they had scientists who were then saying that, no, 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 it's not true. And there's a little clip that was sent to me. And it's a woman I know, a woman called Roberta in um, the USA, an investigative journalist. She's now retired from that, but she was on CNN. And she sent me this little clip in which in 2003, she's at um, a climate change conference, COP existed at that time too, is now the 26th one. But um, at that time, she's interviewing leaders of the fossil fuel industry and saying to them, well, do you think that what these people are saying is true? No, 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 there's no way. And her comment to me was, if I could track these people down and show them what they said at that time, I wonder what their response would be. But I don't think I'm going to go through that exercise. What would be the purpose? For me now, what is more important is to see how we deal with the situation today. And so on the one side, I'm seeing that there's the whole subject of honesty or lack of honesty, which is one part of the truth. And that's related to what's going on in the world at this present moment. Some very passionate like Greta Thunberg mm -hmm. and um, people are dismissive about her sometimes or she's just a very angry young woman. But what she's saying is actually true that the leaders have been blah, blah, blah. <laughs> that was the latest comment that came. Um, so you have truth on that level or honesty and dishonesty. But then there's another truth, which is a higher truth. And whether some would say we are searching for God or whether some would say we are searching for truth on that level, the eternal level, again, there's a passion that drives you, that wants you to understand you're looking for something. And so I think that probably it's that spark that is within everyone who's here today who decided that, well, I don't quite know where I've been invited to, <laughs> but I love Vicky, I trust Vicky, and so I'm going to come. 
Um, but there's something that made you renounce the comfort of your home and come out when it's beginning to get dark quite early and be here. So I think that that inner spark that wants us to find what is truth is a very, very powerful force that's actually going to help us deal with the honesty and dishonesty issues that keep coming up in front of us every day. There are so many things that, you know, like I remember it was only in 2016 that um, the whole subject of um, the false stories that were being circulated and the era of post-truth began. And so truth was another era. And by then 2016, we were in the era of post-truth and I don't think we've come out of it yet. <laughs> So, but um, again, it's a very specific couple of situations that happened. Brexit happened and Trump got elected. So those two were 2016. Mm -hmm. And it was the era of post-truth. And in my mind, they're all connected. <laughs> so um, we are living in strange times, not just climate, but also post-truth era. And so for us to have again that in a voice telling me, where should I go? What should I do? How should I deal with the situations of the world is very, very important. But it brings me back to being able to have that inner space in which I'm able to find that moment of silence and peace within myself that will help me understand what's happening. Well, thank you for that. And you've just brought loads of things back in my head as well. I think what I've learned most from this place is the space, how to find the space from within. And in my job in, in marketing and branding, there's so much, I have to look at social media all the time and I'm almost sick of looking at it because I'm think, I look at it and I think, what's the truth? What's not the truth? You're getting unsolicited advice. Is this the right advice? Is this the wrong advice? And it's, it's that not knowing all the time. And so now I've been taught just to find that space. So like I go down the beach and I just do that or I come here. I have my one Monday nights with Mark and I've met Amanda here as well. He's a really good friend now. And it's just, I, I leave there and I just feel rested. I feel like my brain is rested. I, you know, I just haven't got all that noise boom, 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 the whole time. It's really nice and I think, we're just going to get loads and more and more and more. I can't see social media going away. <laughs> I, I, I just see more of it and more social media channels. And I don't, I just don't know when it's going to stop. So I think it's just taking a responsibility from inside and just thinking it's up to me to get away from it and just have that respite. And I think that's what I found mm -hmm. from coming here, really. So H, does anybody know what H is? It's harmony. <laughs> and harmony is a line in your vision, mission and values. And this is for you to go first. Okay. Um, well, I love what you've just said, the vision, mission and values because I know that for myself, harmony is what's going on inside of me first and foremost. And the harmony that I'm thinking about, which is why I was struck by what you said, um, what is my conscience saying? And what am I actually doing? Are those things aligned? And where there's always a sense of discontent um, that many people have, um, I think it's very much connected with the lack of harmony within. And so where there's a conflict that's going on, my conscience is telling me something, but what I'm actually doing is not following my conscience. And so that disturbance inside means that in terms of relationships, I'm seeking harmonious relationships, but they're not happening. But instead of thinking, well, because so-and-so is like this, so-and-so is like this, if I again step inside and sort things out within myself so that I am more aligned to my conscience and my inner values, then I think 
that sense of security that comes is a very different sense than the discontent and the sensitivity in which you know we get sparked into a rage because somebody does things and so on when i'm secure and i'm comfortable and i'm in harmony with myself then my capacity to be able to understand and align myself with others so that there can be harmony even though we don't share the same ideas we don't share the same lifestyle even maybe but it's like you know when you've got um, an orchestra um, it's different instruments and different notes that are being played but when they all come together hopefully there's harmony <laughs> instead of cacophony <laughs> um, and so I think that the alignment inside and the harmony within makes it much, much easier to experience harmony with others around me. Very good. <laughs> How do I compete with that? <laughs> I don't because we're in harmony, you see. So harmony to me, the vision, mission and values. I used to always have problems finding my vision uh, I know I'm short-sighted, but I always had, I felt a bit of a fraud because I'm an executive coach and which I turned into a branding coach, but I felt a bit of a fraud because I'd be expecting my clients to, you know, find their vision. And in the past, I'm thinking, well, I don't know where I want to be. And, but I was thinking materially before and I was thinking ah, oh, I want to have a big helicopter and I want, I want to fly to the 2k <laughs> and that's where I want to be in 50 years time or oh, less than that 10 years time and then when I started coming here I started thinking well actually I don't particularly want if I if I set my heart on a helicopter then I'm just going to be really miserable and I'm going to be trying to get clients and then I'll be going into meetings just thinking about invoicing them rather than what they really want so after coming here, I've been here like since 2018 now. No, 2019. And in that time, I've learned that my vision now is just to be happy and healthy. And I don't care how that manifests itself. I, I don't know how, how it's going to be at the moment, but I just, my mate, after my health scare last year, health is quite a big one. Um, and we're just talking about what you're talking about the, um, aligning and things not feeling right in marketing uh, in marketing psychology there's something called cognitive dissonance and it's when something goes against your values um, and so like an example of that is if i know i'm saving up for a holiday but I pop into Harrods and there's a nice shiny handbag there. <laughs> and so something, you know, what's the most, most important value to me? Is it the handbag or is it the holiday? You know, and you've got that thing. And that's where, and it's sometimes I feel as a marketer, I feel like a bit of a dissonance really, because I'm telling people to be attached to things, aren't I? And here we're saying, don't be attached to things. <laughs> so there is a bit of a dissonance going on there as well. And so maybe that's why I've got more into illustration lately. I don't know, but I do feel quite uncomfortable, you know, and when I see adverts now and I'm thinking, oh, that's so not right. You know, you're, you're teaching people to especially credit card companies and how they advertise. <laughs> And I've fallen for it loads of times. So I think, I think I've think i definitely got that distance going on now. But I think going back, these are all very interrelated, all these subjects we're talking about. So when we talked about the truth before being genuine, that's really tying in with the vision, mission and values, I think, to me. So I think it's with this, I say to clients, why don't you just find something that really annoys you? And that's generally what is going against your value. So then you flip it into positive. So <laughs> laziness is one thing that really annoys me, apart from not being truthful, of course. And, um, and then so the opposite of lazy is active and action, being, being active. Yeah, action would be one of my values. Mm -hmm. And when I work, there's, there's some areas um, when I see really bad graphic design, 
you know, and I think, oh, please, you know, just give it to me, I'll do it free for you, you know, make it look pretty. And that goes, so creativity is one of my values as well. So I'm telling you what my values are, but the reason I'm telling you is how to find them. So when we do the questions and answers, questions later from you all, it'd be interesting to understand if, if you understood what your values are and how you found them and, if, you know, what, not that we want to make it negative, but, you know, was it because you found things that really annoyed you? I think that's it really for, I mean, it is massive. I think the big thing is it being an internal vision in a sense and not mm. ex like an attachment. That's right. Yes, you can have all sorts of visions of acquisitions of mm. things and property and so on. And you can even get there and then discover there's still an emptiness inside of you. And so when you feel that there is this emptiness, you realize that it wasn't this five bedroom house that you had hoped for, that that would really make you feel content and happy. And it doesn't, it's actually something else. And so then you realize that maybe it's something to do with the world inside of me rather than all the things out there. It's taking that responsibility, isn't it? Mm. Which is what I'm learning. On a journey. Mm. So we're now along to the last one, but it's over to you. <laughs> so tea. Does anyone know what tea is? Something you drink. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one. <laughs> Notice Terry sits at the front as well. <laughs> Thankful. And, oh, I'm answering this one first. <laughs> so yeah, thankful. I think, has everyone here heard of their gratitude diary or gratitude, writing your things down? If you haven't, I find that is the most help, one of the most helpful things that I do now. And it doesn't matter how bad my day is. I always find time to just think of three things that I'm grateful for. And it does vary from day to day. And if I'm feeling like there's nothing gone right today and I can't be thankful for anything in the day at all, I actually thank, uh, I thank my mum. I don't always get on with her. I'm glad you're not here, actually, sorry, mum. Um, for teaching me to swim. Because now I swim like loads. I swim like 10K a week. And when I'm swimming, I meditate. And so when I'm doing my stroke, I'm saying, I am a peaceful soul. I am peaceful, even if I'm angry. And then everybody in the pool moves over for me. <laughs> <laughs> so it really works, this stuff. That's why I'm here. I would be here a <laughs> So if she hadn't told me to swim, I wouldn't have that experience. And then I'm grateful for my sight. And I also love, I'm, I'm almost blind in one eye. Um, but I'm good in what the other, well, still slightly short sighted because I wear glasses, but at least I can see out of one eye. So I'm always grateful that I can see out of one eye. And I'm grateful that uh, I can cook. And mum, my mum taught me to enjoy cooking. So I know so many people who hate cooking. And I can't imagine not being enjoying cooking. So I'm so pleased. I'm grateful. I'm not grateful for cooking. I'm grateful that I enjoy cooking because mm. I think two different things. And it's creativity. And if I've had a really bad day, I'll go and cook. So those are my three. So if I, there's nothing good about the day, I think about those things. And also, how could I forget? Thank you for Steve for introducing me to this place. You know, because I've completely changed my outlook. So, and thank you for you for coming today. <laughs> but yeah, I just think to me, being thankful just puts everything in perspective and it makes you think that life's not so bad after all. Absolutely. Um, I didn't know that there was an actual gratitude diary, but some years ago, um, a, a woman I met taught, said to me, um, I'd like you to do three exercises. And some of you have heard me talk about this, but I don't mind repeating it because it really is very, very powerful. Um, she said, write down a hundred points of gratitude, what it is you're thankful for, right from childhood till today. And she said, it won't take you long. And when she first said it, I thought a hundred points, it is gonna take me long. But actually when you start going through your life and you start writing down a hundred points of gratitude, it really happens very quickly. And then she said, once you've done that exercise, the second step is every night, 
write 10 points of gratitude. And I did all this for about eight months. I, I literally did that for eight months. And then I was traveling a lot and it sort of laxed a bit. And then, <laughs> um, and you look at the day and you begin to think about all the little things that happen that you're grateful for. It doesn't have to be big things, little things, but amazing things, you know. So um, I'm grateful that I was introduced to this by so-and-so, or I'm grateful that so-and-so was around when I was trying to do this and they put their hand forward to help me, all sorts of things. And the third bit of the exercise is Next morning, the day hasn't yet started, and so you think, well, nothing's happened. But again, write down 10 points of gratitude. And in this, you said, um, think about nature, what it is nature has given you. Have gratitude for nature. Um, think about what is there in your life um, that so many people don't have, and so be grateful for that. And so the way your brain starts functioning, when you look at things from that perspective of gratitude, is a very, very different perspective than it used to be before. And, you know, one of the things the scientists tell us now is that the brain has plasticity. And so whatever patterns you thought were absolutely fixed, they don't have to be fixed. You can change them. They can be turned around. And gratitude is a way to change your attitude and the patterns of how your brain works. And so I've personally found it to be very, very helpful for me. And whenever I've shared it with individuals or groups, I know that someone actually begins to do this and it makes a huge difference. Last Christmas, now I don't know what they're doing this Christmas, but last Christmas somebody sent me an by then they were in another part of the world, not in London anymore. But they said that for two years, this was something they had done absolutely every single day. And they were planning to continue with it further on also. And they said that truly their life had been transformed by this one act, just being aware of what it is I'm grateful for. So I do recommend it highly. <laughs> yeah. Great. Definitely, two of us, definitely. Who else does a gratitude diary? Lovely. Hopefully all of you there from now on. Now I've just looked at the time and I realized it's 7.30 and we said tonight was finishing at 7.30 and we wanted to open the floor for questions. So if anybody needs to shoot off really quickly, I would say, would you like to ask your question first? Or has anyone got any questions at all? How are we doing for time? Does anyone need to rush off? So we've got another 20 minutes, say, for questions. You're okay? Who would like to ask a question? I can't believe there's not one question. <laughs> Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> Rub it in the headlines. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I ask what was the most interesting part of tonight? Has somebody got? And I said that last bit. It's really good. I've been going through a really tough time recently with a lot of negativity that I noticed now I've actually started using that negativity. And actually, that's not my role that's not for me to do my role is now to turn that, that negative into a positive from my point of view mm. very good sister gentry have you got anything to, to <laughs> um just to say that um some you mentioned a word earlier um taking responsibility for what's going on in my own inner world mm. and yes um, the world is in a pretty dark state and it's coming to me from all directions, but can I keep the light shining inside and make sure that I stay on track and I'm true to myself? Um, 
you know, that's not my part. That was a lovely expression you used. Um, whatever they're doing is their business, but my part is to be true to myself and have that clarity and awareness of what I need to do. So beautiful, taking that responsibility for the self. Um, I think sometimes it's really easy to be influenced by everything that's going on to such an extent where you have an intention in yourself that you want to materialize, but it doesn't quite match up with what you feel like you have to do because of what the rest of the world is telling you to do. And I think it's really easy from my experience, um, because I think you mentioned being a people pleaser, I'm also a people pleaser. I like to make sure that everyone else is okay before I check on myself. And I think in that sense, it's really easy to sort of lose that harmony if you're not aware of the fact that that needs to exist in order for you to be true to yourself. I thought that was very interesting. I would just say, make sure you take time out for yourself and just take some space to get that space. No matter where you are, there's always somewhere you can disappear to, I think. So sometimes what I do is when I'm going somewhere, I, I, I sometimes when there's too many people in a crowded space feel like, oh, you know, and I, I just need some space like that. So I almost plan in advance where my escape route can be just for <laughs> 10 minutes. So I haven't disappeared yet, but you're not too close. You know, there is a bit of a gap, more at a party or something. Anyone else? I liked um, when you were talking about serving, being a server. And could you just reiterate, go through that a bit again? So I've forgotten the whole context again. I um, you put it so beautifully. And I... I'm, I'm having trouble listen, hearing you, sorry. Um, when you were talking about serving, how important it was to serve, and you know, that's probably the most important thing of all, that we're here to serve one another. And you put it in a beautiful way. Um, it just resonated. I just wonder if you could put it again. <laughs> you, could I rerun what you said? Um, I wouldn't remember the words I used, but the concept is um, there's a difference between thinking that I want to be a leader and thinking I want to be a server. And so when I have that attitude of service, then I'm putting the whole subject of giving to others first rather than what I want for myself, which is a very different thing to people pleasing. It's not that, but to be able to put the needs of others first and to be able to serve them rather than dominate them. And so servant leadership and humility are absolutely aligned. And so as a leader, there can be huge ego if I'm just thinking about the position and power. But as a server, there's a sense of humility, no ego. And so a servant leader is actually one who has that humility and wants to be able to give rather than take. Um, again, just cast your eye around the world and you see so many leaders. And at first you didn't realize, but later all sorts of news and this, it's interesting how, although there's all this darkness in the world, transparency has become quite a big thing. And it's, you can't hide much in the world today. There's always something that's gonna throw up whatever it is. And so you think that they're good leaders and then you discover all the things that they've done, hiding under all sorts of ways. So, a leader is really in the true spirit of leadership as one with humility who's there to be able to give and not to take. Definitely. Yeah, can, I, can I just, I'm just adding on, but you know, we talk about thankfulness and, being, and gratitude. And I think too often we allow ourselves to sink into this thing the world is a dark place, people are doing dark things oh dear, which makes us fearful. And so therefore finding, as you said, all the things that we should be thankful for 
uh, and the people that are speaking out, that are speaking their truth, whatever uh, cost to themselves. And that is happening more and more. But very often we don't see it. They're not shown it unless we actually go and look for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for those. Who would like a meditation? <laughs> the finish off? Almost finish off. Yeah. Mm. Sure. Down there, so yeah. Please stay. So we're not going to make you sit on the floor <laughs> or stand on your head. But just sit relaxed comfortably. And I'll share a few thoughts. And if it's helpful, follow those ideas.
spoke about the wonderful work of Barbara Goodyear and the Bell Abbey Presence in the Chamber. I'm sure it's a nice, nice evening to have a look. You will give each of you a little gift before you agree. So if you please bear with us for just a moment while we um, pass up the necessary table. So please come forward when you're ready, um, and um, uh, it's a fun Smith. We've got many good bags with all kinds of things at the book, and I think you'll find a sweet, and I think you'll find a blessing card in there for you to take away um, to further reflect on things that you've heard. And so I'd like to um, invite um, the, the youth mayor, Henry, please, if you would like to come up first. And please stretch your arms out so if this is done, you can get back in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Felix, and thank you for your contribution. So please, if you'd like to come. <laughs> Greetings to the light within. I'm Shanti, I'm Shanti, oh. Greetings to the living spring. I'm Shanti, I'm Shanti, oh. the light has warmed my frozen skin and energized the self within, the spirit dance will now begin, I'm Shanti. Thank you. 